Hi, everybody. My name is Aubrey. I'm a grateful recovering alcoholic and a member of this group. It's good to see everybody here. Okay, we're on page 34 of the big book and a chapter called More About Alcoholism at the bottom of page 34, the last paragraph. Last week, we talked about, uh, in this chapter, it talks about a lot of the different ways that we can identify as what kind of alcoholic we are or if we are an alcoholic or not yet. There are some people that drink too much. They're heavy drinkers. But if they had to quit, they could. They could do it on their own power. But that's pretty rare. About a man last week who worked, he was getting drunk on his job. He's getting, you know, drinking was kind of interfering with his life. So he was a owner of the business and wanted to do a good job. So he went 25 years without having a drink and then retired. When he retired, he said, well, maybe I can have a drink now that I'm retired. In two months, he was in a hospital, very sick, in an Alba hospital. And in four years, he was dead. He went 25 years without drinking. And when he started drinking again, it killed him when, in four years. So once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. Something we have to keep in mind. And then if you're a drinker, you know, can you quit? Do you lose control? Can you stay away from it for any period of time? You know, if not, you're you're probably an alcoholic, but you have to identify yourself as an alcoholic. Tonight we're going to read a couple more stories about people that you might recognize some of the things in their lives or some of the things in your life, and we'll see what the problems are that that arise from that. So Page 34, bottom of the page. How then shall we help our readers determine to their own satisfaction whether they are one of us? The experiment of quitting for a period of time will be helpful, but we think we can render an even greater service to alcoholic sufferers and perhaps to the medical fraternity, so we shall describe some of the mental states that precede a relapse into drinking, for obviously this is the crux of the problem. What they're saying there is that first drink that gets us. We have to have a defense against the first drink. We talked a lot about that last week. Having a defense and a real defense. Not just, okay, I'm not going to drink anymore. That's not a defense. You need a real defense plan. When you're in a position where alcohol is present, you need to have a defense that either keeps you from drinking or gets you the hell out of the place so you can't drink. So it's important, and we'll see what happens to a guy who doesn't have such a plan. He goes on to say, what sort of thinking dominates an alcoholic who repeats time after time the desperate experiment of the first drink? Friends who have reasoned with him after a spree, which has brought him to the point of divorce or bankruptcy, are mystified when he walks directly into a saloon. Why does he? Of what is he thinking? Thinking, key word. The defense against the first drink and the part of that that gets us to drink again is all mental. It's all about our thinking. And we're going to see a perfect example of that in this guy, Jim. Our first example is a friend we shall call Jim. This man is has a charming wife and family. He inherited a lucrative automobile agency. He had a commendable war record. He is a good salesman. Everybody likes him. He is an intelligent man, normal so far as we can see except for a nervous disposition. He did no drinking until he was 35. Well, I identify with him. He sounds like a great guy. Good old Jim. But then it goes on to say, in a few years, he became so violent when intoxicated that he had to be committed. On leaving the treatment center, or excuse me, the asylum, he came into contact with us. We told him what we knew of alcoholism 
And the answer we had found, he made a beginning. So here's a guy who, when he got out of the hospital, started doing his steps. He started working with Bill and Bob. He made a beginning. He started listening to what they said. He read some stuff. And during this time that he stayed sober for a while, it says his family was reassembled and he began to work as a salesman for the business he had lost through drinking. All went well for a time, but he failed to enlarge his spiritual life. So he had come to believe because he had a spiritual life. So he'd done steps one, step two, and probably a vague attempt stab at step three turn his will and his life over to the care of god his will and his life his will is his thinking his life is his actions so every time we take any kind of action in our lives anything we do we first have a thought about it you know if you get hungry and you say okay i'm going to eat that's a thought and then you go make something to eat, and you eat. but there's actions involved before you know, there's thinking before the actions, okay? To his consternation, he found himself drunk a half a dozen times in rapid su succession. On each of these occasions, we worked with him, reviewing carefully what had happened. He agreed he was a real alcoholic and in serious condition. He knew he faced another trip to the asylum if he kept on. Moreover, he would lose his family for whom he had deep affection. So this guy was working the program of Alcoholics Anonymous with a sponsor in the big book. Okay, so he's doing good. But yet he got drunk again. We asked him to tell us exactly how it happened. This is his story. I came to work Tuesday morning. What happened to Monday? I remember I felt irritated that I had to be a salesman for a concern I once owned. I had a few words with the boss, but nothing serious. I decided to drive into the country and see one of my prospects for a car. On the way, I felt hungry, so I stopped at a roadside place where they have a bar. I had no intention of drinking. I just thought I would get a sandwich. I also had a notion that I might find a customer in this place, which was familiar, for I had been going to it for years. I had eaten there many times during the months I was sober. So this is not an unusual situation for this guy. This guy had been to this place a million times. Nothing abnormal about his behavior so far. Had a couple of words with a boss, but that's nothing serious. His boss is probably pissed because he didn't come to work on Monday and he didn't show up until Tuesday. So, you know, it would be obvious that there would be some, you know, wrangling going on there. And then he had some good ideas. He said, he, you know, get out of there. Don't have an argument with the boss. Just get out and go find a, a guy that will buy a car outside the showroom. So nothing different, nothing abnormal at all. So he wasn't, you know, he was fine. He goes, still no thought of drinking. I ordered a, another sandwich, and I decided to have another glass of milk. So the only thing weird there is he had two sandwiches. How many of you go out to, to lunch, sit down, have your lunch, a sandwich, and a drink? And when you're done, order another sandwich and another drink. So that was a little weird, but nothing out of the ordinary. But now, listen to this next paragraph. And most of it is in italics. Every time there's something in italics in the big book, it's something that is important. He said, suddenly the thought crossed my mind that if I were to put an ounce of whiskey in my milk, it wouldn't hurt me on a full stomach. I ordered a whiskey and poured it into the milk. Okay. That was his first insane thing of the day okay and all it was was a thought no action at all he's sitting at a table and a thought crossed his mind how long does that take a split second for that thought to come hey 
A whiskey and milk won't hurt me. A split second. Okay. I vaguely sensed that I was not being too smart, but felt reassured as I was taking the whiskey on a full stomach. So another little thought saying, boy, maybe this is a mistake. But he did it anyway, because he rationalized and justified. He said, I got a full stomach. The whiskey won't hurt me. So let's be rational about that. If that would have been true, why would you have drank it? Remember, the book tells us we drink whiskey for the effect, not the taste. So if you're going to drink whiskey, but because you got a full stomach and you got milk in there and you're not going to get drunk, why would you drink it? And it certainly wasn't for taste because whiskey poured in milk. I can't even imagine how horrible that must have been. But he did it. The experiment went so well that I ordered another whiskey and poured it into more milk. He said, um, the experiment went so well, I ordered another whiskey and poured it into more milk. That didn't seem to bother me, so I tried another. So in a matter of just a few minutes, he's had three drinks. He's drinking them so fast that the first one didn't even have time to get into his system, and he's having a second one. And as soon as the second one was gone, he had his third one. So, he, of course, it didn't affect him yet. He was drinking them too fast. He had three whiskeys without even a thought. I mean, he never, I mean, this is after months of being sober, working with Bill and Bob, working on the steps. He came to believe he's done his three steps turned his will and his life over to the care of God, and then went out and had some drinks. So he was normal about everything that day until he made that one thought allowed him to drink. And he justified and rationalized that. So, thus started one more journey to the asylum for Jim. Here was the threat of commitment, the loss of family and position, to say nothing of that intense mental and physical suffering which drinking always caused him. He didn't even think about that. He didn't think about what he had lost previously. He was, you know, he had lost a business from his drinking. Now he's working as a salesman for a company he used to own. So drinking really took a lot away from him, you know, and he fought to get his family back together, and yet he was risking it again for three shots of whiskey and a glass of milk. Doesn't make sense. So he says, he had much knowledge about himself as an alcoholic, yet all reasons for not drinking were easily pushed aside in favor of the foolish idea that he could take whiskey if only he mixed it with milk. So again, a foolish idea, a thinking. He was thinking. His thinking was flawed. He had a foolish idea. He had a thought cross his mind, then he had another foolish idea. And he drank whiskey, but he didn't think about the consequences at all. Goes on to say, whatever the precise definition of, definition of the word may be, we call this plain insanity. How can such a lack of proportion and of the ability to think straight be called anything else? We define an AA, we define insanity as doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. But every time we do that thing over and over again, we get the same results. We get drunk, we get sick, we get hospitalized, we lose our family, we lose our job, we lose our car, we lose our girlfriend, you know, and we, we pay the price every time. And then we say, we'll never do it again. And then we do it again. You know, but this guy's thinking was flawed. 
The alcohol could have done nothing to him if he would have thought right. And this is a place he had been where he had remained sober. So it wasn't like it was a strange situation. He could go there and be sober. He had proved that he could go there and be sober and get up and leave without having a drink. He had done that in the past, but that didn't come to his mind here. What came to his mind was a drink and a glass of whiskey, a drink and a glass of milk. Can't do that. He says, so you, you may think this an extreme case. To us, it is not far-fetched, for this kind of thinking has been characterized characteristic of every one of us. We have sometimes reflected more than Jim did upon the consequences, but there was always the curious mental phenomenon that parallel to our sound reasoning, there inevitably ran some insanely trivial excuse for taking the first drink. The sound reasoning failed to hold us in check. The insane idea won out. Next day, we would ask ourselves, in all earnestness and sincerity, how could it have happened? We have great insight 24 hours later when we wake up with a hangover. Oh, my God, how did this happen? But at the moment of truth, when you're in the bar, when you're in the restaurant, when you're with your friends, whenever you're drinking, the thought never comes to your mind then. And you take that first drink. Well, once you've had the first one, we know alcohol. We have the allergy to alcohol. Once you have one, you're going to have a second. This guy had three at his lunch table, period. Bang, 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 had three. Never thought of anything else. Didn't think of the consequences. They say in AA, the, we didn't play the tape through. So... In some circumstances, we have gone out deliberately to get drunk, feeling ourselves justified by nervousness, anger, worry, depression, jealousy, or the like. So what are those things? Nervousness, anger, worry, depression, and jealousy. They're all emotions. You drink because of emotions. You get nervous. That's a form of fear, being nervous. So we're, we have fear. We have anger. We talk about that in the fourth step. Fear, anger. We talk about that all the time in the fourth step. Worry, depression, jealousy. All things that are emotions, that are negative emotions, not good for us. Not going to help us out at all. And in those cases, our thinking goes south and we're vulnerable to a drink. But even in this type of beginning, we are obliged to admit that our justification for a spree was insanely insufficient in the light of what always happened. So... How many times you said, oh, I'm so mad, I need a drink, and you get the drink, and you wake up in the morning, and you say, oh, shit, I wasn't that mad. Why did I do this to myself? You know, our, our excuse was lacking. We now see that when we begin to drink deliberately instead of casually, there was little serious or effective thought during the period of premeditation of what the terrific consequences might be. So our thinking stops with the idea of actually having the drink. It doesn't continue to say, okay, so if I have a drink, what's going to happen to me? We don't carry that thought process all the way through. So we give in at the point of having a drink. We have the drink. Next thing you know, we're drunk. So we have to have better thinking. And that's why the plan that we have for a defense against the first drink is a real thing. So that when you're in a position where you're angry and nervous and worried and depressed and jealous, that you know that you're feeling an emotion that will drive you to drink. So stay away from booze. Get away from booze. Change your, your attitude. Let the anger go. Let the fear go. Pray about it. 
you know, and this is a guy that's in the program. Not a guy that's out there just a drunk and doesn't have any program. This is a guy that has a program he's done since one, two, and three. And he still got drunk. Our behavior is absurd and incomprehensible with respect to the first drink as that of an individual with a passion, say, for jaywalking. So here's the story of our jaywalker. He gets a thrill out of skipping in front of fast-moving vehicles. He enjoys himself for a few years in spite of friendly warnings. Up to this point, you would label him as a foolish chap having queer ideas of fun. Luck then deserts him, and he is slightly injured several times in succession. You would expect him, if he were normal, to cut it out. Presently, he is hit again, and this time has a fractured skull. Within a week of leaving the hospital, a fast-moving trolley car breaks his arm. He tells you he has decided to stop jaywalking for good, but in a few weeks, he breaks both legs. That's very much like the way we drink. We drink, and it hurts us a little bit. We get slightly damaged. And we say, ooh, I better be careful. But then we keep on drinking. Then it starts hurting us worse. You start really feeling bad. You have bad hangovers. You start getting sick. You got to see a doctor. The doctors always tell us, how many beers do you drink a day? And we always say two when we drink 22, you know. So we lie to the doctors. And he says, you better not drink again. And we say, okay, doc. We walk out the front door of the doctor's office and head to the nearest bar and get drunk. Because we don't listen and we don't think. And that's what this guy does. So on through the years, his conduct continues, accompanied by his continual promises to be careful or to keep off the streets altogether. Finally, he can no longer work. His wife gets a divorce and he is held up to ridicule. He tries every known means to get the jaywalking idea, thought, out of his head. He shuts himself up in the asylum, hoping to mend his ways. But the day he comes out, he races in front of a fire engine, which breaks his back. Such a man would be crazy, wouldn't he? But if you replace drinking alcohol and deciding to pick up a first drink with any of those injuries and any of those things, it sounds just like drinking. We don't get hurt much in the beginning, and we can last for years with only minor getting sick. And then we start getting really sick and really hurt, and we end up in the hospital a few times. And then we get really hurt, you know, because alcohol destroys your liver, destroys your, you know, it messes up your heart. It messes up your kidneys. It messes up your pancreas. And many alcoholics die of pancreatic cancer or liver disease. You know, it's really bad. And we keep on hurting ourselves, just like the jaywalker. But it's with alcohol, not bumpers of cars and fire trucks and stuff. So you may think our illustration is too ridiculous. But is it? We who have been through the ringer have to admit if we substituted alcoholism for jaywalking, the illustration would fit us exactly. However intelligent we may have been in other respects where alcohol has been involved, we have been strangely insane. It's strong language, but isn't it true? So, heavy duty. Okay. Some of us are thinking, yes. What you tell us is true, but it doesn't fully apply. We admit we have some of these symptoms, but we have not gone to the extremes you fellows did, nor are we likely to, for we understand ourselves so well that what you have told us at, that such things cannot happen again. 
We have not lost everything in life through drinking, and we certainly do not intend to. Thanks for the information. Little attitude from some people. They just don't see themselves being alcoholics. They won't admit it. Then it goes, they may be true of certain non-alcoholic people who, though drinking foolishly and heavily at the present time, are able to stop or moderate because their brains and bodies have not been damaged as ours were. But the actual or potential alcoholic, with hardly an exception, will be absolutely unable to stop drinking on the basis of self-knowledge. An important concept in AA, because our self-knowledge is not the tool we need. Many people with the, all the self-knowledge about themselves are still unable to drink if they've crossed the line. If maybe they were not alcoholics in the beginning, this is a progressive disease. So you can be a heavy drinker and at some point you're, you can quit. But once you cross the line, then there's no turning back. Now you've become a real alcoholic and there's no escape through human means. You can't do it yourself. All the self-knowledge in the world can't stop you. What other people tell you, you're not going to listen to, just like these guys. Oh, thanks for the information. That kind of attitude will keep you drunk. So, not good. Self, self-knowledge will not work. This is a point we wish to emphasize and re-emphasize to smash home upon our alcoholic readers as it has been revealed to us out of bitter experience. Let us make another illustration. So now we're going to talk about Fred, my friend Fred. Very casual Fred. Okay. Fred is a partner in a well-known accounting firm. His income is good. He is a fine, he has a fine home. He is happily married and a father of promising children of college age. He has so attractive a personality that he makes friends with everyone. If ever there is a success, successful businessman, it is Fred. To all appearance, he is a stable, well-balanced individual. Yet, he is an alcoholic. We first saw Fred about a year ago in the hospital where he had gone to recover from a bad case of jitters. It was his first experience of this kind, and he was much ashamed of it. Far from admitting he was an alcoholic, he told himself he came to the hospital to rest his nerves. I've done a lot of nerve resting in my past. But he won't admit that he's an alcoholic. And then he told himself he came to the hospital to rest his nerves. He lied to himself. He couldn't even tell himself the truth. Now, he could have told Bill and Bob when they went to see him, oh, I'm just here to rest my nerves. He could have told the doctor he's there to rest his nerves. But he lied to himself. He told himself he's there to rest his nerves when he had the shake so bad he couldn't function. And he was so sick from drinking, he couldn't function. And he, he trivializes it by making it sound like, well, I'm just, you know, I just got to rest my nerve. Need a break. So, the doctor intimated strongly that he might be worse than he realized. For a few days, he was depressed about his condition. He made up his mind to quit drinking altogether. It never occurred to him that perhaps he could not do so in spite of his character and standing. Fred would not believe himself an alcoholic, much less accept a spiritual remedy for his problem. So he wouldn't do step one, and he absolutely wouldn't do step two. This was a guy who just wouldn't take, you know, Bill and Bob went to see him, and he just denied he was an alcoholic. He's laying in the hospital for now the second time, 
laying in the hospital, really sick, and wouldn't admit he was an alcoholic. He says, we told him what we knew about alcoholism. He was interested and conceded that he had some of the symptoms, but he was a long way from admitting that he could do nothing about it himself. He was positive that his humiliating experience, plus the knowledge he had acquired, would keep him sober for the rest of his life. Self-knowledge would fix it. Self-knowledge will not fix it. So again, this guy is lying to himself. We heard no more of Fred for a while. One day we were told he was back in the hospital. This time he was quite shaky. He soon indicated he was anxious to see us. The story he told us is most instructive, for here was a chap absolutely convinced he had to stop drinking, who had no excuse for drinking, who exhibited splendid judgment and determination in all his other concern, yet was flat on his back nevertheless. Let him tell you about it. I was much impressed with what you fellows said about alcoholism, and I frankly did not believe it would be possible for me to drink again. I rather appreciated your ideas about subtle insanity which precedes the first drink, but I was confident it would not happen to me after what I had learned. I reasoned I was not so far advanced as most of you fellows, that I had been unusually successful in licking my other personal problems, and that I would therefore be successful where you men failed. Little better than thou attitude. I felt I had every right to be self-confident that it would be only a matter of exercising my willpower and keeping on guard. <clears throat> willpower and keeping on guard. <clears throat> Let's see how that worked for him. He said, in this frame of mind, I went about my business for, and for a time all was well. I had no trouble refusing drinks and began to wonder if I had not been making too hard work of a simple matter. He still believed after being in the hospital twice, resting his nerves and quite shaky the next time, embarrassed and all that, he still thought it was just a simple matter. That he, he wouldn't, he wondered if he was making too hard of a work of getting sober after two times in the hospital. One day, I went to Washington to present some accounting evidence to a government bureau. I had been out of town before during this particular dry spell, so there was nothing new about that. Physically, I felt fine. Neither did I have any pressing problems or worries. My business came off well. I was pleased and knew my partners would be too. It was the end of a perfect day not a cloud on the horizon. So now, this guy is like, how great is this now? We just read about those of the other guy drinking because of depression and anger and worry and all those negative emotions. This guy's having more emotions, but they're positive emotions. He's exhilarated. He had a wonderful day, just made a lot of money for the company. It's been a great day. So what happened? I went to my hotel and leisurely dressed for dinner. As I crossed the threshold of the dining room, the thought came to mind that it would be nice to have a couple of cocktails with dinner. Again, one thought. No action, no coercion, no nothing, nobody around. It wasn't that he's being forced to drink by other people. Oh, come on, one more hurt you. No, it was just a thought went through his head as he's walking by himself and to have dinner. A couple of cocktails would be good with dinner. And this guy's already decided to have two. It's not even the first drink. He's decided already to have a couple. And we know what happens when we have two drinks. 
there's definitely going to be a third. And he should have known that. He's a drinker. He's an alcoholic. That was all. Nothing more. I ordered a cocktail with my meal. Then I ordered another cocktail. After dinner, I decided to take a walk. When I returned to the hotel, it struck me that a highball would be fine before going to bed. So I stepped into the bar and had one. I remember having several more that night and plenty the next morning. This, drank, this guy drank through the night and into the next day. And the thought that he had was, a couple of cocktails at dinner would be nice. And hours later, he's had a whole bunch of whiskey and he's still going. So even the fact that he decided to have two was bad enough, but it's not going to stop at two. So here he is really drunk. He said, I have a shadowy recollection of being in an airplane bound for New York. And of finding a friendly taxi cab driver at the landing field instead of my wife. Because he'd been drinking all day. His wife was supposed to pick him up at, a, at the airport and he got in late and she wasn't there. So he gets in a cab. The driver escorted me about for several days. I know little of where I went or what I said and did. Then came the hospital and unbearable mental and physical suffering. So this guy went from having a couple of drinks at dinner to days and days of just drinking his ass off and drinking himself right back into a hospital. Went from beautiful day, the perfect day, great business day to the hospital. Typical alcoholic. As soon as I regained my ability to think, because he realized that the one thing he hadn't been doing for those days was thinking properly. As soon as I regained my ability to think, I went carefully over that evening in Washington. Not only had I been off guard, remember when he said I would stay on guard? Well, that didn't happen. He said, not only had I been off guard, I had made no fight whatever against the first drink. This time, I had not thought of the consequences at all. I had commenced to drink as carelessly as, those, as though cocktails were ginger ale. I now remembered what my alcoholic friends told me, had told me, how they prophesied that if I had an alcoholic mind, the time and place would come, I would drink again. They, they had said that though I did raise a defense, it would one day give way before some trivial reason for having a drink. Well, just that did happen and more. For what I had learned of alcoholism did not occur to me. That's why self-knowledge won't work, because when you need your self-knowledge, it won't occur to you. I knew from that moment that I had an alcoholic mind. So he finally admitted he was an alcoholic. I saw that willpower and self-knowledge would not help in those strange mental blank spots. I had never been able to understand people who said that a problem had them hopelessly defeated. I knew now it was a crushing blow. So that's where we'll leave him tonight. That's the story of this guy who was sober but refused to believe that he was an alcoholic, and that's what happened to him. And now next week, we're going to read about, he got back with the two members of Alcoholics Anonymous and they explained things to him and we'll see what happened to him and see how he recovered from that hopeless situation then. And we'll finish up the chapter more about alcohol next week. Thank you all for listening.